All right, let's see. Hey guys, I see everybody. Yep, mostly class here. Um, uh, yeah, hey Jacob, you ask about lab. Yeah, no, uh, like I said last week, we're really not going to be doing any more labs. There's one lab. I might have you watch this video. Um, I'm debating if I should even have you do it. <laughs> um, it probably will be like in a few weeks, like next week or the week after, if I have you guys do it. But yeah, but pretty much at this time, yeah, we're really not going to be doing any more labs. Um, so pretty much on, on Tuesday, yeah. So on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, we'll just go over the lecture material. Thursdays, kind of open it for a free, a free day to either ask questions, go over problems, or I might continue with a lecture if I feel like we're running behind. Um, I'll kind of... Uh, use that day as like a third day of lecture, especially since this week, since yesterday was the exam, I missed a whole day of a lecture. Um, so depending on how far we get, like uh, for for today, um, we might continue tomorrow. I definitely will have class tomorrow, but it might just be either a, a Q&A or just um, continuing with the lecture since we have the exam. Um, so I hope that kind of explains it. Uh, the first thing I have to say, this is, uh, I've been kind of dreading to have to say this, but for some reason, all of the exams got erased. I don't know how that happened. Um, so I'm struggling with having you guys retake that exam over again. Um, so I'm just kidding. April for those guys. I just <laughs> felt like I had to cut the tension somehow, so I figured I'd do that. <laughs> I was going to play along. Yeah, I know. I know, Anna. I'm sorry. But well, Amy thought it was funny. <laughs> oh, God. Um, no, so um, I looked over. The... <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. I debated about doing it. Actually, it was, my, it was my kids who told me I should do that to you guys. I'm like, you guys are evil. I'm like, well, that's a good idea. <laughs> uh, there was one year for April Fools. I... Uh, um, I changed all the clocks in my house. I put everything uh, an hour and a half later. So, um, yeah, those meddling kids, I know exactly, right? Uh, they have too much time in their hands, apparently, by staying home instead of going to school. Uh, but there was one year, this was, this was like, I don't know, 12, 13 years ago. Um, I played a joke on my wife. I, I, uh, I put the clocks forward an hour and a half in the whole entire house. I'm, I'm more of a morning person, so I woke up and changed all the clocks. Um, and, uh, her alarm clock went off an hour and a half earlier than it usually was. She's not a morning person. So she got up and it was darker outside and she was confused, but she got ready for work and she was like, um, you know, and, and, <laughs> and I finally told her it was an hour and a half later. Um, so that was, that was kind of funny. We were talking about that this morning. My kids were asking me if I ever played a joke on mom. And I said, yeah, I did that one, and I'll probably never do that one again. <laughs> Didn't go over. It was funny, but she was not very happy about it. She said, I missed an hour and a half of sleep. So, anyways. Okay. So, uh, anyways, as far as the exams, um, I looked over them very quickly uh, just to see how you guys did. And, you know, for the most part, I think a lot of you did very well. You were able to answer the questions uh, uh, pretty much how I wanted them. So um, it's going to take a little bit longer like to grade those since I don't have the hard copy. I have to download each of them. Um, and some of you uh, have posted each page individually. So you're going to have to download each page, uh, which is fine. Um, but then I'll have, I, you know, I got to grade them and, and your quizzes too. I'm probably not going to make remarks on the exam. So if a few of the, uh, the quizzes I graded, I was able to actually put a remark. I, you know, I, I would type in something like it should be this. Um, on the exams, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that because it would take a very long time. So what I'm thinking I'm going to do is uh, I'm just going to put a um, uh, I, I'm going to post the exam back online with all the answers on them. So then you can just go through it and see w what the answers are. Um, if you do have a question about yours individually, then we can schedule a meeting or something. Or if you just want to email me um, about a certain problem. Um, uh, I'm fine with that, uh, but as far as um, uh, as far as the answers, that's kind of how I'm going to do that. Okay, does that sound okay? You guys can put a yes if you want, or if you have a question or something. Okay, good. 
Um, I'm gonna. I want to try to get them. I want to try to get everything done graded. Your quizzes. Uh, there are a few of you that I did grade your quizzes, but uh, the rest of the class I haven't yet. But I want to get the quizzes and the exams graded at least by next week when we meet again. So in the next week, I'll have all that graded. All right. And then in the meantime, we will do chapter eight today. Uh, we'll probably get through all of chapter eight today. Uh, let me. Um, yeah. And then, like I said, tomorrow. Uh, we can go over again chapter 8 stuff, go over questions, do whatever we want to do for tomorrow. And other than that, we're just moving right along. Okay. Okay, so, any questions? Anyone have any questions or comments before we start? Uh, I did have a comment last week. Uh, last Thursday... Uh, when we met for the Q&A, I think three or four people showed up. Um, I, I was able to get uh, like this little pad and pen thing. I'm able to write on it. And that lecture was more like a typical lecture where I explain something and I would write it on the board and stuff like that. So I'm going to try to do more of that. Um, it's kind of hard to do completely. So I am going to use the slides, um, but I'll, I'll kind of switch it back and forth between the slides and writing on the pad. But pretty much how I think we're going to do this is we're going to go through each of the topics that I talk about on the video and in the notes, and then we'll stop if you have any questions, and we'll do a problem or two from the uh, homework uh, that's related uh, um, like to those problems. That's kind of how, how we'll do it. Okay. Okay, so chapter eight, alcohols and ethers. Let me um, get everything organized here. Okay, so uh, alcohols, phenols, and ethers. Um, here they kind of talk about uh, the difference between them. I think you guys pretty much know the difference between all of them. Let me lower this real quick. <clears throat> okay, so we know what alcohols are. A phenol is just an, an OH hanging off of an aromatic ring. What makes them special is they are much more acidic than a regular alcohol. So these phenols are more acidic than a regular alcohol, and that's because of the resonance. Once you pluck off this hydrogen, I'll put it up here, you have this aromatic ring with an O in its lone pairs and an minus charge. And this negative charge is stabilized by the resonance inside of the ring. Okay, so these alcohols are more acidic. Alcohols usually have a pKa roughly around 16 to 17. I believe in one of the slides on this I talked about it. But these phenols have a pKa closer to about 9 to 10. Okay, so if you remember on the, on the pKa scale is a exponent scale. So it's about a million times more acidic. All right, so it's, you know, 10 to the 6 times more acidic. Um, that's actually a billion times. So it's a billion times more acidic than uh, a, a regular alcohol because of that resonance. Again, just to show you um, how important um, resonance is. And then uh, the chapter also talks about ethers. All right, so we'll talk about all those. Primary, secondary, tertiary, we, all, we talk about these all the time in every chapter. Just kind of get some of the nomenclature. Um, so a primary alcohol is one where you have one carbon group attached to it. Primary, secondary, you have two carbon groups. Tertiary, three carbon groups. So I'm gonna real quick. Okay, naming. So naming alcohols, I'm going to stop and we're going to do a, f a few problems here. But uh, alcohol is basically uh, N in O-L. And pretty much the way you name it is you you name it by the ane version of it. So like if you have um, five carbons, it's called a pentane. This happens quite a bit. Um, it's if I hold my marker down too long on this thing. So if, so if you take the, the pentane equivalent of the molecule and drop the E and put an OL uh, at the end of it. So it's a pentanol, 
is how you call a five-membered alcohol. All right, so if you look at that, a pentanol. Um, there are two ways of naming it. They show you an old way and a new way. We are just going to worry about the new way. Don't worry about the old way. Um, I believe the homework and the answer guide does it all the new way. So pretty much whatever carbon has the OH group on it, you have to tell the reader where the OH is. Is it on the first carbon, second carbon, third carbon, fourth, and so forth and so on. So you name it as a pentan, and then you put in the number at where the alcohol is and end it in OL. So that's basically how the parent works. And your longest chain is a chain that includes the alcohol. All right, like we learned with uh, a double bond, it's the longest chain that includes our double bond is our longest chain. All right, so uh, that's phenol. So why don't we just do a few problems right now since we're talking about it. This is kind of my pad. All right, let's do this. I'm going to write a alcohol. Let's use one of these structures here. Let's do this. I wanted to redraw that one. Looks a little weird. Okay, so why don't you guys take a minute or so and name that molecule, just so for some practice. Okay, <clears throat> so you look for the longest continuous chain of carbons. It includes the OH. So that would be this right here. Okay, and then you got to choose a side in which to start counting on. So the question is, do you start on the side closest to the chlorine, or do you start on the side closest to the alcohol? Well, since the alcohol is our parent, that gets the priority. So I'm going to start counting on the side closest to the OH group. Okay, if the OH was on carbon-3, um, uh, you know, uh, well, that's not a good example, but it's pretty much wh whatever side is closest to the alcohol, that's the side I start counting on. It doesn't matter about our substituents. Okay. So, I think I could change colors here. Let's try that. There we go. So that's carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, carbon 4, carbon 5. All right, I have a substituent on carbon 3 and a substituent on carbon 4. All right, so naming this, uh, chloro comes before methyl, so 4 chloro. Three methyl and then pentan two all. Make sense? Any questions on that? Uh, why don't we do another one? I think if I just do this, I can delete everything at once. I had a problem with that the other day. Alright, let's do another one. Let's do... Um, oh, this one I'm going to give you the name. I want you to write the structure. I'll give you the name and you draw the structure. So let's do trans three ethyl cyclohexanol. Trans three ethyl cyclohexanol. So why don't you guys take a little bit of time and work on that one? Okay, <clears throat> so in this case, your parent is a cyclohexanol. And on the third, so 
you don't have to say, so you know, in naming alcohols, you always have a number right here, like one, all, or something. But with a cyclo, the carbon one is always the alcohol. Because the alcohol, that gets the priority. The OH will get priority. So carbon one is always the alcohol in this case. So you, you don't have to say cyclohexa and, I'm sorry, cyclohexam one all, because it's always number one. Okay, it's kind of like with a double bond. Remember, if you have a double bond in the ring, that's always carbon one and two. The same thing here for the alcohol. So at the one and at the three spot, all right, you're going to have your groups, and it's trans. So if we put, so you have to show the stereochemistry in this case. So if we have the OH coming out, that means your ethyl group has to be going back. So that would be trans three ethyl cyclohexamol. And you know, if you have the OH going back and the ethyl group like coming out, that's totally fine too. Um, you know, and if you have the OH on this carbon, as long as you have the ethyl there, it doesn't really matter where, as long as you have the trans. Okay, any questions on that? We're good for the most part. Um, what if, I don't know if, let's see if you're, I'm trying to look at these other examples. They're not here, I don't want to talk about it. Okay, okay good. Okay, so with that said, let's go back to the notes real quick. Okay, um, phenols, in naming phenols, if you wanted to name a phenol, um, that's basically the parent. I think the phenol was one of the um, examples uh, in the aromatic chapter that I had you guys memorize. So if you have an aromatic ring and you have an OH, the parent in this case is called a phenol. Phenol. P-H-E-N-O-L. Let me do that again. Okay, and this is always our carbon one. But you don't have to tell the reader it's carbon one. So if you have a so if you have a you know an aromatic ring that has like a, I don't know, a chlorine hanging off of it, let's say you have a chlorine here with the OH here. All right, uh, this would just be called, I mean, we learned about this in chapter five, but this would be called metachlorophenol. Metachlorophenol. Again, sorry about that line, it happens a lot in this. All right, or you can say three chloro, three chlorophenol if you wanted to. Okay, so that, that, that would be our parent. Here are just some, our, our common names for some alcohols. Benzyl alcohol. Remember, we talked about the benzylic position on a uh, uh, on the carbon next door to an aromatic ring. We call that the benzylic carbon. Well, if you just have the carbon and an aromatic ring and the OH hanging off of it, it's called benzyl alcohol. This is just a common name. If you see these, um, remember, if we have a double bond with a carbon right next to it, if we have a plus charge there, it's called the allylic carbon. Well, if you have an alcohol on it, it's called the allyl alcohol, short for allylic. All right, here is the tert butyl. We talked about this with an E2 elimination, the tert butoxide or butanol. So tert butyl alcohol. These are just some common names. You don't really have to memorize these. I'm just I'm making them aware because in the homework they sometimes will reference those molecules. <clears throat> but mostly on the phenol. Any questions on naming phenols? Again, that was chapter five, but uh, since it's an alcohol, we talk about it here. I do want to talk more about ethers, naming ethers. Ethers, there are two ways to name this. Two, oh, that doesn't look like a two. Two ways. One is where ether is the parent. Ether is the parent. And then the other way is where the ether is a substituent. Okay, so the question is, how do you know when it's the parent, and how do you know it's acting as a substituent? Uh, this goes back when we learned aromatic rings, like when do you use the benzene as the parent, and when do you call it phenol as a substituent? It's the same type of thing. So here I have an ether. I have a methyl group on one side and an isopropyl group on the other. These groups are easy to actually name. 
One's in methyl, one's in isopropyl. So in this case, the ether is our parent, and you just name the two groups alphabetically. So I have an isopropyl group, I have a methyl group, followed by ether. So isopropyl, methyl, ether. It's very easy. If I have like a, a, a CH3 on one side and a CH2 and a CH3 on the other side, all right, that's an ethyl group, that's a methyl group, that's an ether, ether. So it's ethyl, methyl, ether. Very simple. Ethyl is alphabetically first. Ethyl, methyl, ether. All right. Here, pretty straightforward. I have an ethyl group and I have a phenyl ring. So name it alphabetically. Ethyl, phenyl, ether. All right. If I have two of the same groups, let's say I have a, a methyl and another methyl. This you just name dimethyl ether. Or if I have two ethyl groups, diethyl ether. Two isopropyl groups, diisopropyl ether. Very simple. That's if the ether, this one we're talking about, is the parent. Okay. Now, what happens when the ether is a substituent? That's these examples down here. This is where, so if you look at our ether group here, all right, here's my oxygen. One side I have, I have a tert butyl. That's very easy to actually name. Okay. But this I have a, it's not a cyclohexyl. It's a, um, a, it's a, a, a cyclohexene group. And the double bond is on two and three. Okay, so in this case, this is not an easy group to actually name. So when that happens, this becomes my parent. The group that's not easy to actually name, that's now your parent ring. And this becomes a substituent. Okay, so let me show you how we would name that. Let's go back over here. So we have a cyclohexene. And hanging off of here, we have a terbutyl group. Okay, so in this case, the ether is not the parent. This is our parent. Our, our cyclohexene group is our parent. Okay, so if that's the parent, this whole thing now becomes this whole thing now becomes a substituent. And when the ether group, or the group, the easy group with the oxygen is our parent, it is some sort of an oxy group, okay? The prefix is the name of this group. So since that's a tert butyl group, this is called tert butoxy. All right, and we'll do a few other examples. So in this case, here, here's our parent. So my parent is, remember, my parent is a cyclohexene in this case. Uh, and let's see, I have to, one, so lab, numbering it would be 1, 2, 3, 4, opposed to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this would be called 4 tert butoxy cyclohexene. Okay. So the oxygen group is a substituent. If it was just a methyl group, if I had a chain and I had an O with a CH3, and this was my substituent, it would be called a methoxy. If it was two groups, ethoxy. If it was um, three carbons or a propyl group, it would, call, it would be called propoxy. So all you do is you name the prefix, ethyl, methyl, terbutyl, isopropyl, whatever, followed by oxy at the name of it. So that means I have that group attached onto the oxygen and it's hanging off of the parent molecule. Okay, so let's see if we can find some examples. So for example, let's do, are, are, are there any questions on that before I find examples? All right, so I'm gonna put, let's say I'll, I'll put two ethers down here and name them accordingly. All right, there you go. Two different problems. So name them how you would name them. I'll give you some time. I'll put this on pause. Okay, so for the top one, these two groups are pretty easy to name. 
All right, this is a propyl group. And this is a cyclohexyl group. So we're going to just easily name it cyclohexyl propyl ether. Simple as that. I kind of like this program. This program works really well. It doesn't give me that funky line either. Cyclohexyl propyl ether. All right. Does that green show up okay, or is it kind of hard to see? Looks like it might be a little hard to see. I won't use that green. I can use the blue. It looks fine. Okay. Now this one. I have an ethyl group on this side, so that's easy to name, but this group is not a simple, easy group. All right, it's not like how it was up here. So in this case, this is gonna be my parent compound, this longest continuous chain of carbons. That's my parent. And the ether is gonna act as a substituent in this case, hanging off. All right, the same for the chlorine is gonna be hanging off. Okay, so in numbering this, I basically go back to the alkene rules, and the alkene rules are the carbon closest to the double bond is where I start counting. So this is going to be carbon one right here. That's carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, carbon five, carbon six. All right, and this is a chloro, and this is called a ethoxy group. Because it's two carbons for the ethyl, and since it has the oxygen, it's called ethoxy. All right, so we're naming this, we will have 6-chloro, 4, must be a hyphen there, ethoxy, ethoxy, and 6 carbons, so hex 1e. 6-chloro, 4-ethoxy. Hex 1E. Make sense? Any questions on that? All right, good. All right, so I think we were good with naming. All right, properties. Um, let me just make sure, I'm just going to go through here. So yeah, hydrogen bonding, and then, okay. yeah. Okay, so alcohols have hydrogen bonding. So because of the hydrogen bonding, uh, boiling points are relatively higher than other functional groups. Um, carboxylic acids we've talked about, we haven't talked about yet, but, but oh, question, yes. Anna, do you have a question? If, uh, so if there was no double bond, would we have started counting from the other side? Yes, because... Uh, no, it's no. Uh, the ether is a substituent. It's not a. It's not the parent molecule. Um, so uh, let's go back to this problem. So if I didn't have the double bond, it's a good question. Let's say we don't. Let me go up to the eraser. Erase the double bond. What we would do now is basically my parent molecule is a hexane, and I just look at the two substituents and I count the side closest to whichever substituent is closer onto a side. So I go back uh, with my alkane rules. So here we'll do purple. So this would be our carbon one since chlorine is on carbon one. So this does not get a priority. This just acts as a substituent. So between chlorine and the um, ethoxy, the chlorine is on the carbon one, and this would be on a carbon three, two, three, four, five, six. So this would be one chloro, three ethoxy hexane. Okay, yep, no problem, Andy. Okay, so I'm not gonna read all this stuff because it basically this is just basically saying you have hydrogen bonding. Uh, carboxylic acids form the strongest hydrogen bonds, so they usually have the highest boiling points or melting points. Alcohols are next. They have the next strongest hydrogen bond. So alcohols for their size uh, usually have pretty strong, uh, have usually pretty high boiling point points because of the fact that they form um, hydrogen bonding because those intermolecular forces are pretty strong. Okay, um, 
The other thing is acidity. Let's talk about acidity. Alcohols uh, can act as an acid or a base. All right, they can act as both. Um, I don't know if you guys remember Gen Chem days, but we call that amphoteric. Oh, no. I'm to get them going here. Okay, uh, amphoteric. Amphoteric. Not really something I'll have an exam, but uh, you might hear this word a lot if you've taken other science classes. Basically, means both. It has both of the opposite properties. So it has both acid and base properties. Okay, so it acts as an acid and a base. It acts as an acid because, well, in this case, it's acting as a base. My alcohol here is acting as a base because notice it's reacting with the acid. All right, we've actually seen a mechanism like this last chapter on the alcohol chapter uh, with the D, uh, when you take an alcohol and you turn it to an alkyl halide. So let me just remind you of the reaction. You take an alcohol plus add HCl to it or HBr, you form the chlorine right here. All right, the mechanism was the oxygen. I think we I went over this mechanism mechanism last Thursday. Last Thursday there was a question about this um, in the review session, and we went over this mechanism where the alcohol grabs onto the hydrogen. You form a water molecule. We talked about water is a good leaving group. And then so, and the water leaves to give you a plus charge, and the chlorine comes in. I'm not going to go over that mechanism. That was last chapter. That's basically what's happening. The lone pairs are attacking the acid to form water. Notice that's a water molecule, which will eventually leave to form an R plus charge. Okay, so here's where the alcohol can act as a base. All right, it can also act as an acid. Uh, where this is acting as a base. Mostly this will be a hydroxide. I don't like how they used a water molecule. So let's ignore the water molecule. It'll be a base. It'll be a hydroxide, a strong base usually. It'll have some sort of a strong base. Remember, strong is anything that has a negative charge. And these electrons will pluck off that hydrogen because these are slightly acidic because oxygen has a partial negative charge. is much more electronegative, pulling on this hydrogen, making it have a partial positive charge. So if you add a base in there, it can pluck off the hydrogen and put the negative charge now on the oxygen, just like what we have over here. All right, it happens more so in phenols because remember a phenol is much more acidic. Okay, remember that the pKa's are roughly around nine or ten, so these are much more acidic protons. So if you have a hydroxide or something like that, these can really pluck off these hydrogens to form these minus charges. And the reason, again, it's more acidic is because this ion is more stabilized, all right, because of the resonance structure, okay? So alcohols can act as both acids or bases, um, and, um, uh, and it's because, again, you have the oxygen, which is a partial negative, and hydrogen is a partial positive. If you remember chapter, I think it was chapter one, um, they, there was a problem when we were learning about Lewis acids and bases, they would have a problem like this, CH3OH. And ask, and they would ask you, I think I have this on the exam too, I'd say, does this act as an a, a Lewis acid or a Lewis base? And the answer is, it's both a Lewis acid and a base. It depends on which atom we're talking about. And then if you remember the quiz, I said, is this an acid a base, in particular the oxygen atom? So I'd say, look at the oxygen atom and tell me, is this acting as a Lewis acid or a Lewis base? Well, you had to go back and figure out this is partial negative charge, so this is acting as the base. All right? And if I said, it's the same question, but I said, but with respect to the hydrogen, you would say it's acting as an acid. It just all depends on what I'm adding to it. If I'm adding an acid to it, then the oxygen is doing a reaction. If I'm adding a base to it, then the hydrogen is doing the reaction. It really depends on, on what I'm adding to it. All right, so this is going back to what we talked about in chapter one. It's, uh, it's, it's showing up here again. Okay, pKa's, we don't have to worry about all this stuff, but as long as you understand what the pKa is, and we've been talking a lot about it all throughout uh, the semester, um, just to kind of show you alcohols are roughly in this 15 to 18 category, 15 to 18, just a regular aliphatic alcohol. All right, so like methanol, ethanol, whatever, they're roughly about the same, okay? But once we get to a phenol, remember I told you that a phenol is roughly around 10, so about a, a billion times more acidic 
So they're showing you that the phenols are much more acidic. And then look at this, paranitrophenol. So let's look at this. And now notice that that paranitrophenol is even more acidic than just a regular phenol. All right. Remember, phenol is just this without the nitro group. All right. So paranitrophenol is a thousand times more acidic than just regular phenol. So why is it so much more acidic? Well, it's because, remember, we talked about the more resonant structures you have, the more stabilized that charge. So the nitro group, if you remember, also has a pi bond in it. All right, that's the Lewis structure of a nitro group. All right, so um, to redraw this, uh, let's do this real quick. So to redraw with a nitro on here. Oh man. <laughs> All right, once I pluck off this hydrogen, I'll have a, a negative charge, and it can resonate not only through the ring, but it also it can resonate outside of here, and that pi bond is part of the resonance structure. All right, so we talked about that aromatic rings can usually have four resonance structures. Well, we're going to add a fifth one to it. So more resonance structure, more stabilizing that charge, which makes the hydrogen more acidic. All right, so let me write this. More resonance... implies more acidic in this case because the negative charge that forms is more stabilized okay so the negative charge is more stabilized so these are all the the re reasoning behind everything if i say why is this alcohol more acidic well, the negative charge is more stabilized because of the more resonant structures, therefore it's more acidic. These kind of three things kind of go hand in hand in this chapter. Okay. Uh, if you remember when we talked about carboxylic acids, I know this is a little bit off the topic, but not really. It's kind of based off of everything. We, you know, I said, why, why is this functional group called a carboxylic acid? Why are these the most acidic? Because when you pluck off this hydrogen and you get this, it's called a carboxylate, oops, carboxylate ion with an O minus, right? This negative charge is stabilized into the aromatic ring. Uh, I'm sorry, into the oxygen because of resonance. Okay, so the oxygen is more electronegative, so it's really stabilizing that minus charge a lot. So that's why carboxylic acids are more negative. So carboxylic acids are the most negative because the negative charge is most stabilized because of the resonance structure. So you're going to kind of cut, you're going to keep seeing this theme over and over again, resonance. Um, all right, so it's not just important that you know that's resonance, you got to know why it's resonance because of the, you know, it's more acidic, it's more stabilized, all that stuff. Okay, so this whole chart, the whole pKa chart is basically showing you the more resonance structures you have, the more stabilized that, that negative charge, therefore the stronger the acid. All right, I think that's relative acidity. All right, what am I talking about that stuff? We already talked about that. Phenol, same thing, more stabilized, resonance. Synthesis of alcohols. Okay, uh, any questions up until now about any of that stuff, about the properties of alcohols, uh, naming? <clears throat> All right, let's talk about synthesis of alcohols. Now I'm going to get into synthesis. I want to go over a review first. Your book doesn't really do this, uh, but on my class notes, I do. So I kind of want to go back and forth between what I have on my notes and what um, they, they have. So let's go here. Okay, so let's do a review as to how to make alcohols. Review of synthesis of alcohols. Let me change that. 
Okay, so some review. So one reaction we learned is if you take a double bond and you add acid and water, I'm going to put it as H3O+, plus. this is the hydration reaction, you can make an alcohol, right? Remember, it goes Markovnikov. That's a chapter four. Chapter four reaction, Markovnikov. We also have the anti-Markovnikov. So add BH3, and then the second step is H2O2. I'm doing this quick because we already, you guys should have this so memorized by now. You've probably seen this a hundred times. That's also chapter four, anti-Markovnikov. Another one is the SN2 reaction. If you take a halogen plus add a strong base to it, all right, you get SN2 or SN1. So I'll just put here SN2 or SN1 if you just add the weak version of it. All right. Um, what other reactions have we learned? I think those are, is that pretty much all the reactions you guys can think of for synthesizing alcohols? I think that's it. Chapter four. I mean, there was the diols. We have diol synthesis. I don't know if we really need to go over that. But remember, that's if you have a double bond. Plus, you can add the KMNO4. KMNO4. Plus, uh, what is this? That's the sodium hydroxide. You get the cis diol. All right, we also have the trans diol. The trans diol, remember, came from the epoxide. I'm not going to write it down here, uh, but just to remind you, the trans diol is from the epoxide opening. You have the epoxide, plus you add hydroxide or water, you can pop it open. All right, um, I think those were all the ways to form an alcohol that, that we learned. So this is kind of review of the ways that we learn alcohol. Um, what, what you'll kind of see is that alcohol is kind of a, 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 a central functional group in order to synthesize any other functional group that you want. Okay, so that's just kind of a quick review of that. Uh, in this chapter, we're going to learn new ways of how to make al uh, alcohols. All right, but any questions on the review part? Or are there other ones that I missed that you guys think that was pretty good? Yeah, double bond. Okay. Okay, in this chapter, we are going to be doing a reduction. All right, so reduction of a carbonyl. Okay, and this is basically the overall reaction. You have a carbonyl compound. Remember, carbonyl compounds, I'm going to name some of them aldehydes, ketones, esters, carboxylic acid. Those are the four main ones that we're going to be looking at. So ketone, aldehydes, carboxylic acids, I'll put CA for carboxylic acids, esters. These are the four main carbonyl compounds that we're going to look at this, this uh, chapter that we can convert into alcohols. We can take these four groups and convert them into an alcohol by a reaction that's classified as a reduction. Okay. And basically what you're doing is adding uh, hydrogen across our double bond by putting a hydrogen here and by putting a hydrogen here and getting rid of that double bond. That's basically how we're doing it. Okay. Um, so if you remember, we talked about this a while ago, uh, the oxidation and a reduction. So if you go from an alcohol to a carbonyl, that's a, a, a one step in oxidation. And if you go even further, you can go to a carboxylic acid. So we talked about this in chapter four. Um, so if you take a primary alcohol, you can go to the aldehyde and eventually oxidize it up to a carboxylic acid. You guys remember this? If you have a secondary alcohol, you just can go to the ketone. It stops at, at the ketone. All right. Um, so here, they actually, you know what? Well, let's just... Just to make sure. I don't want to say you, you remember. Let's just do it. Got plenty of time. So if you have a primary alcohol, right? Remember, primary means you only have one carbon attached to it. So primary alcohol. A one step in oxidation is the aldehyde. So remember, I add a bond to carbon and I take away a hydrogen. So I'm taking away this hydrogen, but mostly important, it's the hydrogen that's attached to the carbon. That's what I'm talking about. And then if I do a second oxidation on this, I can go straight up to the carboxylic acid. So that's even further in oxidation. All right. 
And then a reduction is the opposite. So going this direction, you usually add a hydrogen. All right, so going from a carboxylic acid to an aldehyde, we add a hydrogen, is a reduction. All right, I should, kind of, I should take that arrow away. All right, going that direction is a reduction. So alcohol to aldehyde is a one-step oxidation. Going to the carboxylic acid is another step. All right, and then a reduction is the opposite. Now, if I have a secondary alcohol, secondary, I can only do one step oxidation up to the ketone. All right, I cannot go any further because I don't have a hydrogen attached to it. Remember, oxidation means a removal of a hydrogen on the carbon. Okay. So I have a hydrogen here that gets removed to get the aldehyde, and I can move another hydrogen to get to the carboxylic acid. In this case, I just have one hydrogen attached onto my carbon. So I can only go one step. You can't go any further. And then a tertiary, you have no hydrogens on the carbon, so therefore you can't, you, you, you can't even oxidize that. Okay? So primaries go to aldehydes and then eventually to carboxylic acids. All right? Secondary just goes to a ketone. But you can also go the opposite way. Carboxylic acids go to aldehydes, and then the aldehyde can go to the alcohol. All right? So that was just kind of review for what we talked about um, when we talked about the oxidative cleavage when we did all that in Chapter 4. Okay? So that's basically, but basically what the reaction is, is you're going from a uh, carbonyl compound starting at a carbonyl and, and adding a hydrogen onto here and a hydrogen onto there, and you get rid of that double bond. That's a reduction. Okay, so here's an aldehyde. You can take an aldehyde and reduce it to the primary alcohol, ketone to the secondary alcohol. We just talked about that. All right, and the reagents that we're going to look at, there are two different types of reagents. One is called sodium borohydride, NADH4. These are the actual reagents. These are these H sources, or what's called a hydride. So we're adding hydride to it. All right, hydride is this. It's a hydrogen with a negative charge. Okay, another reagent is called lithium aluminum hydride. And we're, we're going to see these. All right, this is a much stronger reducing agent. This is like a nuclear bomb. For, for short, people usually call this LAH. And again, it's also a hydride source, but it's kind of a nuclear bomb of hydride sources, where this is very stable, it's very cheap, uh, you, you, you can weigh it out on the balance. LAH is kind of one of these very strong reducing agents that you, you can't do it in the presence of oxygen. It will actually reduce oxygen. Um, uh, in grad school, you have, uh, in gra when I was in graduate school, we uh, you have to use a syringe. This is actually a liquid. You have to use a a, um, a syringe under inert atmosphere. That means you can't have any oxygen in the atmosphere. Um, because what what we used to do for fun, it's really not safe, but we'd pull it up in the syringe and then I'd squirt the syringe across the room and you'd kind of see a flame kind of all coming out of the, uh, of the, of the syringe because the hydride was actually reducing the oxygen in the air, and it's a very exothermic reaction, so it would actually ignite in the air, so it was kind of cool to see. Um, but this is saved, uh, I'll kind of show you when you use LAH versus when you use the sodium borohydride. This is a white powder, and it's not as violent of a reaction. So we're gonna talk about the sodium borohydride, and then we'll talk about when you use LAH, okay? So, uh, sodium borohydride is not that s sensitive, as I said, to moisture and oxygen. Um, and it's basically a hydride source, like I said, an H minus source. So, basically, what you do is if you have an aldehyde or a ketone, aldehydes or ketones get reduced with sodium borohydride. That's when you use the sodium borohydride as aldehydes and ketones. <clears throat> okay, so if you have an aldehyde and you want to go down one step, to the alcohol, you add uh, the first step is sodium borohydride, and then add acid. 
Uh, here's a ketone. Ketone, same thing. You take the, the sodium borohydride, and the second step is acid. We'll talk about a mechanism uh, uh, shortly about how, how it's done, and you can go to the alcohol. Okay. Basically, how this works is again sodium sodium borohydride is a pretty complicated molecule, but it's basically a hydride source. It's a source of H minuses. So this is our nucleophile, right? This has a negative charge, all right? Uh, here's a question. Is this a strong nucleophile or a weak nucleophile? Why don't you go ahead and put an S or a W in the chat box and let me know if you think it's a strong nucleophile or a weak nucleophile. Yep, exactly. It's a strong nucleophile. You got it. It has a negative charge, all right? So it's going to be attracted towards the partial positive carbon. Remember, a carbon is partial positive. It's more electronegative than the oxygen. Partial negative. So basically, it attacks the carbon, and it kicks up the pi bonds. That's basically what this is. This is acting as a very complicated H- minus source. All right. Now, the boron is involved in this. I'm not going to talk about all that stuff. It, it, it really gets involved. It's not something that we need to talk about in this class. But just kind of think of this as an H-. minus. And you form this intermediate, which is called an alkoxide. So this is step one. So if you remember it here, I have two steps. Step one is the sodium borohydride. Step two now is adding acid. All right. Step two is the protonation of that O negative. Okay. So notice we have an O negative after our step one. So this negative, I'm going to put H plus here as acid. That negative protonates itself in order to form an OH at the end. So most reactions in this chapter are going to have a second step where you add acid to it. Okay? So that's basically how sodium, bor sodium borohydride works. All right? So if you have an aldehyde or ketone, not if you have a carboxylic acid or ester. These are just used, again, for aldehydes and ketones. LAH is going to be used for the carboxylic acids and the esters. But for right now, we're just talking about aldehydes and ketones. Okay, so any questions on this or on the mechanism? And again, it's two steps. It's a two-step process. It's not all together at once. You have to add the sodium borohydride first, let it do, and it does its reaction, and then you add the, the H plus as the protonation step. Okay, now for carboxylic acids and esters, we use LAH instead of borohydride because this is not uh, as strong uh, in order to reduce a carboxylic acid or ester. The, the mechanism is the same. Everything is the same. We have an H minus, and this will come in and attack, and I'll kind of show you what happens. Uh, but in this case, what happens here, let's actually go back to the page because we've got to talk more about this. All right, let's clear this. Okay, so in this case, we have a carboxylic acid. All right, and you add LaO. Oh, I didn't want to erase that. Here, let's put it down here. Uh, so we have a prime, let's put a primary alcohol. Goes to an aldehyde. goes to a carboxylic acid. And obviously the opposite is the reduction. So if I were to add LAH to this, now if I add sodium borohydride, nothing happens. There's no reaction. Just remember, we have to use the stronger guns, the lithium aluminum hydride. We go directly to the alcohol. This is what I want to talk about. And then you also form water as a byproduct. Okay. Notice you can go from the carboxylic acid down to the aldehyde and then from the aldehyde to the alcohol. Notice we're going from the carboxylic acid straight to the alcohol. We're going from here, we're going from here, we're going from here straight to here. We're not going to the aldehyde. Okay? That's what LH does. There is there is no reaction that we're going to learn that goes from the carboxylic acid to the aldehyde. There are re reagents that do it, um, but they're very specialized. And even if you use those reagents, it doesn't really work that well. You get like a 50-50 mixture of the alcohol and the aldehyde. 
okay? So pretty much what people do is they reduce down to the alcohol and then they oxidize back up into the aldehyde, which we'll learn uh, on the second half of this, okay? So LAH goes straight down to the alcohol. Same if you, if you, if you have an ester. If you have an ester, same thing. So let's do OC and you add LAH to it. And then your second step is adding acid. It goes straight to the alcohol. And this time you get this O. So this part of it right there is that part of it right there. All right, we'll kind of go over a mechanism in a bit. Okay, but LAH goes straight down to the alcohol. It does not stop at the aldehyde. Okay, so any questions on that? before I go over a mechanism to kind of explain how this works. Okay. All right, so let's talk about a quick mechanism here. So again, LAH is a hydride source, H minus. Okay, so what's gonna happen? Now the thing is, is that this reduces this twice. So you, you can see what happens. This H minus comes in here and kicks up these pi bonds. You know what? Let's do this, the hydrogens, in like a red color so that we can kind of follow where, where that hydrogen is going. I wonder if there's a way to bring that down here. I'm sure there is. I'm just So that way I can just click on that and bring it back and forth. So that's what I was trying to do. Okay. okay, so this hydride, the hydrogen added into here, notice that we have a negative charge. What happens now is this negative charge pops back down and kicks out this OH. So notice what functional group we actually form in the middle of this reaction. Notice it is the aldehyde. And then we also have this hydroxide that's kind of floating around. Okay, so you remember I said previously, let me write this back down again. Alcohol to the aldehyde to the carboxylic acid. And I said that LAH will take this straight down to the alcohol. Okay. But notice you're forming this aldehyde as an intermediate. Okay, You can't stop this reaction. What basically happens is now I form the aldehyde, but another equivalent of this hydride now w w w will come in. So you, you, can't act, you can't actually stop it at the aldehyde. It goes through the aldehyde as an intermediate, but then once you form the aldehyde, another equivalent of hydrogen will come in and it kicks up the pi bond. So that mechanism is like the mechanism that we saw previously. Now, now everything's in red. So you basically are taking your carbonic silk acid and adding two hydrides onto it. All right, with the sodium borohydride, you're only adding one hydride because it's going from this aldehyde into that alcohol and then BH. Okay, so it's basically, with LAH, even in the ester case, it's happening twice. <clears throat> and then, on our second step, is adding the H+, plus, the acid. So the acid protonates that negative charge. Let me go back to black here. So you get C, C, O, H. And then you have your two hydrides that you just added. And then also, it protonates this O- minus that we formed to actually form water. So H, and then your OH. Okay, so LAH is doing it twice. It, it, re, it, it reduces it down to the aldehyde, and then it gets reduced further to the alcohol. You can't stop at the aldehyde. It just goes. You do not stop it, go. Go straight to jail. Anyone that plays Monopoly. That's basically what's happening. Don't collect your $100. Okay? Okay. Any questions on that? Okay. 
stick around here. I don't want to talk about that later. Or not right now. Um, okay, so what I want to do, I want to show you this little chart. Yeah, I, I want. So the Grenier reactions are. I wanted to. See, I think I thought I. Let me just check my notes real quick. Make sure I got everything. Yeah, that green I'm going to save until the next chapter. Talk about next chapter. Any questions? Okay, I do. I do want to go over this real quick. I'm going to show you a schematic. This might. So it's going to. I'm going to try to make a summary of everything that we've talked about. Okay. So if we have, let's put here. Let's put a primary alcohol. Oh. Um, so, uh, do you guys want to take a break, or do you want to just go and we'll just finish class like 10 to 15 minutes early? What do you guys want to do? So put B for break. Okay, just keep going. All right. Okay. So let's um, go back to the slides real quick. Um, uh, this Grignard reaction, we're going to talk, um, I'm going to save this for next chapter. Okay, I know they talk about it here, but we're going to save this for next chapter. I think it fits better next chapter. Let me just look at my notes real quick. All right, I want to talk about the oxidizing agents next, and then we'll talk about all this other stuff, this dehydration uh, in, uh, on Tuesday. Next Tuesday. Okay, so we talked about reduction. So... So we just talked about how to reduce carbonyls. So if we have a carbonyl, we add either sodium borohydride, if it's a ketone or ester, or you can add LAH, and you get the alcohol. Now the other thing I want to mention is LAH can be used to reduce ketones and aldehydes as well. So remember I said on a ketone or aldehyde, you only need the sodium borohydride, and LAH is used for the carboxylic acids and esters. LAH can actually be used for all four of them. Okay, you don't have to use LAH just for uh, a, a carboxylic acid or ester. Okay, you can use this. I mean, if this, if our, our sodium borohydride will works on ketones and aldehydes, this will too. But there's no reason, if I have a ketone and I want to do a, a re reduction, would you rather play it safe and just use a very stable compound that won't explode in your face? Or are you like, well, I like LAH, I think it's so cool, and you know, the, and the risk is so much fun, I'll use LAH. All right, that, that, that's usually not how people think. <laughs> All right, it's like, if I have a stable, safe compound, I'm going to use that if I can. There is no reason to actually use a, a strong one. Now, you could, though. But why use a nuclear, you know, why use a nuclear bomb if you're trying to kill a fly, right? You're going to use a fly swatter. Uh, it's a lot safer and better than, you know, sure, a nuclear bomb will kill a fly. But if I, you know, if I just want to kill a fly, I'll just use a fly swatter. I don't have to use a nuclear bomb. All right, that's kind of the analogy here. Okay, so LAH can be used for everything, but typically it's just used for an acid and an ester. Okay, so with that said, let's now talk about the op opposite reaction. If I have an alcohol and I want to form the carbonyl in this case, we're going to use an oxidizing agent. Okay, and the oxidizing agents, there are actually uh, four of them that I want to talk about. I do not want to talk about this because we've already talked about it. But the two or the four main ones, there are the strong ones, which are the, chrom the, the chromium and the and the sodium dichromate. Those are the strong oxidizing agents, and we'll talk about when you use those. A weaker form of the, of the uh, oxidizing agent is this one right here, is the periodinane compound. For short, I'm gonna call it a PI, so a Desmartin periodinane. Uh, Desmartin is the name of the two scientists who came up with it, but we're just gonna call it PI. And it's a much more mild oxidizing agent. Another one that's not in your book, but is very, very common, 
is is PCC. This is also a mild one. This also has a chromium molecule on it. But these two, PI and PCC, are the mild forms, and we'll talk about when you use those. And then the stronger ones are these chromium molecules, which are usually done in acid. Okay, so we have the, the CRO3 or the sodium dichromate. This is kind of the one that I use most often, uh, but either one of them works. And then the more mild ones are the PI and the PCC. Okay, so notice if you have a primary, you can oxidize it to the aldehyde or go up to the carboxylic acid. If you have a secondary, you, you go to the ketone. So I'll, I'll just give you a summary right here on how to do this. So if you want to go from the um, primary alcohol to the aldehyde, if you want it to stop at the aldehyde, you're going to use the more mild reducing agents. So this is either PI or you can use PCC, either one. Okay. If you want to go from the secondary alcohol to the ketone, notice I can't oxidize any further. You can also use PI or PCC. All right, but if I want to go to the carboxylic acid, that's when I use the stronger oxidizing agents. So I can either go from the aldehyde to the carboxylic acid using either the CO3, usually it's done in acid, or the dichromium, the Na2, Cr2, and O7, which is also done in acid. But you can also go from the primary alcohol to this using the same reagents, the chromium molecules. All right, and I'm going to do a summary for you guys that, that will have all, um, all this in there. I, I just want you to understand, if you want to go to the acid, you have to use the stronger ones. If you just want to go to the aldehyde or ketone, then you just need to use the mild ones. Now, on the secondary, because it stops at the ketone, you can also use here the CRO3 or the Na2, CR207. Uh, both of them are done in acid. So for secondary, you can use any four of them because it can't go any further. It, it doesn't matter which ones I use, either the fly swatter equivalent or the nuclear bomb, it still stops at the ketone. But in the primary case, since you can form an aldehyde or a carboxylic acid, aldehydes are the more mild ones, the PI or the PCC, but the carboxylic acids, you, you got to use the heavy gun one, the, um, the chromium oxide or the sodium dichromate molecule. And tertiaries obviously won't oxidize um, any further. Okay, so here's an example. Here's a primary alcohol and they're using the chromium in the presence of acid. Okay, so again, um, you can use either one of these. Okay, and even though the aldehyde is the intermediate, notice it can't be isolated. It goes straight to, to the carboxylic acid. Okay, um, here is if I want to go to the ketone, it's secondary. All right, I can use any of them. Okay, so I can use the chromium or the sodium dichromate, or I can use the pariodinine, all right? Or, again, your book does not talk about PCC, but anytime I use PI, you can also use uh, the PCC, all right? But these are more expensive, uh, so I don't want you to worry about this stuff. We're not really concerned about price or, or, or sensitivity or anything. Um, so basically, I can use anything on the secondary. Okay, so with that said, uh, we're not going to go through a mechanism on this, so don't worry about the mechanism for these. So let me do a kind of a summary of all this. All right, let's first look at a primary. So if I have a primary alcohol, remember primary alcohols have two hydrogens and a carbon. Okay, so to go to the aldehyde, And then the carboxylic acid, this is going to be a summary of everything. Okay, so let's do a difficult, let's do, for oxidation, if I want to go from a primary alcohol to an aldehyde, I either use PCC or PI. If I want to go from the primary, I kind of didn't leave myself a lot of room here. 
to the carboxylic acid. Now, you can make yours a lot neater. We're going to use the CrO3 in acid or the sodium dichromate to the 7 in acid. Okay, so primary alcohol just to the aldehyde, PCCPI. If you want to go straight to the carboxylic acid, you got to use the, uh, the stronger ones. Also, if you want to go from an aldehyde to the carboxylic acid, I'm just going to kind of include myself on that line there. So aldehyde, the carboxylic acid, you have to same, use the same reagents, the chromium uh, and the acid. All right. And then we learned, let's say we want to go the other direction. If we want to go from the carboxylic acid to, let's do, let's do a different color. Let's do yellow. Uh, it's kind of like a, a yucky yellow. To the primary alcohol that uses LAH. First step, second step is acid. And if I want to go from the aldehyde to the primary alcohol, you have two options either one, the sodium borohydride, which is the preferred one, or you can also do LAH. Sorry, it's not as neat. Uh, in class, I usually make it a lot neater. It's just hard to draw this thing, but um, I'm trying the best I can. I think you guys have the idea. I'm, I'm just trying to show you the the whole thing we just learned all in the, you know, kind of like a one-stop shop. Okay. Now let's do the same thing for a secondary alcohol. Here, we just have a ketone. We can't go any further. So, to go from the alcohol to the ketone for oxidizing, you can use any of the four reagents. So, I'll write it here. PCC, PI, CRO3 in acid, or Na2Cr2O7 in acid. So any three of them, because it, it doesn't matter, I can't go any further. Like in the case up here, because of the fact that the aldehyde, I can go even further. But with, with but a secondary, I can't go any further, so I can use all of them. And then going from the ketone to the alcohol, let's do a different color there. Should have done that. You can either do sodium borohydride or you can do LH. In this case, you can do e e either one you want. And tertiary, it won't it won't get oxidized. So don't have to worry about that. Okay. So does that help? That makes sense. Hopefully that kind of organizes things a little bit. All right, good. Thanks, Anna. Okay, questions? Let's go back to this dehydration reaction. There's no questions on those. Okay, this is all right. Good. So now we're going to switch gears. No more oxidation reduction. Uh, this is just a reaction with alcohols. This is to go from a. So chapter four, we learned how to go from a double bond to an alcohol. All right. That's acid and water. We're going Markovnikov or or anti Markovnikov, we've done that a thousand times. Chapter four reaction, H plus and one. Okay, but what if you want to go from an alcohol to a double bond? How do you do that? Well, that's this reaction right here. It's called a dehydration reaction because we are losing a molecule of water. All right, and this is done in acid with heat. All right, um, so here is the reaction. This is just a generic reaction. So alcohol plus acid and water. 
Uh, in this case, there are two different double bonds that can form. There's a more substituted, tri-substituted, versus a least substituted, di-substituted. We learned in the E1, E2 chapter, so chapter 7, all right, which one is the product that forms? Well, the major product is the more substituted reaction. You guys remember whose rule that was? You can say it because I, I don't know how to spell it. But you guys remember whose rule? Yep, okay, that's good. Zeit. Zeitsef, good, good spelling. My goodness, you guys are good at spelling. Right, Zeitsef's rule. Zeitsef said you form the more, uh, the more substituted alkene. So that rule still applies here. All right, so very good. Um, so here's the mechanism. Uh, why don't I go over it since that's, I mean, it's good. I mean, here it's laid out for you, but with, with the arrow pushing, I think it, because that's what we do in class all the time. So I'll just keep it consistent and uh, clear all that. All right, so let's say we just have a generic alcohol. That's not cares. And then we add acid and water. So I'll put acid, also put a molecule of water here. All right, and we also heat this. So first part, if we're an acid, remember, um, depending on what reagent I'm in is how this will react. Because remember, it's amphoteric. So the oxygen, which is partial negative, all right, remember the oxygen is partial negative. All right, so the oxygen, grab it protonates. All right, the protonates, what molecule am I forming? I'm forming a water molecule, All right? Remember we said water is a good leaving group. So that's exactly what is going to happen. This water is going to leave because oxygen does not want to have a positive charge. Oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. So between the two, the carbon would rather have the plus charge than an oxygen. Because oxygen is more electronegative, carbon is less electronegative. So if I had a choice between a positive on a carbon or on an oxygen, it's going to choose the carbon because it's less electronegative. That's the driving force of this reaction. You, you might be thinking, why, why would that want to leave and get a carbon positive? Well, it's more stable than an oxygen positive. So a water molecule uh, popped off and I get a carbocation. Okay. This next part of the mechanism is very E1-like. We call it E1 in quotes like because it's not really an E1 reaction. E1 reactions have halogens here, but it's very E1 like. If you remember, E1 is where I form a plus charge, and then the hydrogen next door, the base, the weak base, plucks off that beta hydrogen. As remember, we talked about the alpha and the beta hydrogens. It's the hydrogens next door to that carbocation. Uh, that, that carbo so that's the E1 part of it. All right, and notice we are regenerating an H plus, H3O plus molecule, which remember is our acid, because the acid in this case is acting at, as a catalyst. That's supposed to be cat, the catalyst. So that's the re regeneration of the catalyst. Okay, so that's the basic mechanism. First, protonation to form water. Water is a good leaving group. They give me a carbocation. Once I have the carbocation, the weak base comes over and plucks off the neighboring hydrogen, beta hydrogen, just like we saw in E1, to then give me the pi bond. All right, so just to kind of show you this, how, how this explains it, it's the same exact way. So you can see the first step is the alcohol is protonating itself. All right to give you a water molecule, water leaves to give you the carbocation, and then the, the weak base, which in this case is water, plucks off the beta hydrogen, and we talked about beta hydrogens, and to eventually give you a double bond. That's a dehydration reaction. All right, this we talked about. Um, reactions I kind of don't want to talk about. I want to talk about, I kind of want to talk about this. But we're really not going to talk about this part of it at all. Cyclical ether oxides we already talked about. Okay, 
So let me talk about the other stuff that I want to talk about in this chapter. I don't want to use these slides because there's extra stuff there that's not important. All right, next thing I want to talk about is how do you form alkoxides? We talk about them a lot. Um, so how do you make them? An alkoxide is a carbon with an oxygen that has a negative charge. Okay, remember, this is a strong nucleophile. We talk about these a lot. When we do SN1, uh, I'm sorry, SN2 reactions, if we just have a negative charge of some sort, right? How, how do you make these? All right, you make them from an alcohol, all right? So you start with an alcohol, and you add, there are two different reagents. One is you can just add s sodium metal. So I'm going to put an S there for solid. It's sodium, the element of sodium. I don't know if you guys have ever seen it. Uh, usually I do a demo in class with sodium. If you take sodium and you drop it in water, it's very reactive. It, it forms hydrogen gas. And because the reaction is exothermic, it actually ignites the hydrogen gas on top of the water. So you actually have a, a, a yellow bluish flame that's actually is, um, all, is floating on top of water. It, it's kind of cool to see. Um, so in class I do this, but since we're not in class, I can't do it. Um, but if you go online on YouTube and say sodium in water, you'll find tons of, um, videos on it. But basically it's an exothermic reaction and it plucks off this hydrogen and forms hydrogen gas. So what happens is you form the O negative, all right? And the sodium is our counter ion for it. Remember, you can't just have a negative charge. You have to have a counter ion. Plus you form hydrogen gas. Okay, so the hydrogen here pairs up with another hydrogen on another alcohol uh, to actually form hydrogen gas. Okay, so that's kind of how you form these O negatives. All right, if you've ever seen, like I said, if you take water and add sodium into it, it's a very exothermic reaction. You get the, the flame plus you form sodium hydroxide. This is actually how you make sodium hydroxide. Okay. But that's how you form alkoxides, anything that has a negative charge. Even We even use this reagent, NaNH2. Right? We use that for the acetylide reaction. Basically the same thing, but in this case you take ammonia and add, add, sodium, add sodium metal to it. You form hydrogen and the sodium amide. Okay? So that's how you form these compounds, these O-negative compounds. Another way is rather than using sodium metal, uh, you can actually just use sodium hydride. So if you start with OH and add this reagent, sodium hydride. This is, so just to kind of explain what that is, it's a sodium, it's an ionic molecule with a hydride source, which we have seen where hydride <coughs> is used. And what happens is the hydride reacts with the hydrogen, so the mechanism is this H minus pairs up to form H2, and these electrons go on, on the oxygen. So you form O minus, again, plus hydrogen gas, and the sodium is our counter ion, again, for our O minus. So there are two reagents, either like sodium itself, now it's not sodium ion, it's sodium the metal, all right? This is the elemental form, the element of sodium. All right, it's not Na plus. All right, it forms Na plus, but it's not Na, Na plus. And another reagent it is sodium hydride, and that turns alcohols into the alkoxide form, the O minus form. All right. So, um, one of the reactions, this reaction we have already learned, they kind of go over it again. It's how to synthesize ethers, All right? This reaction is what's called a Williamson ether synthesis. And then after this, I think we'll stop for today. The Williamson ether synthesis, All right? This is how you form ethers. Basically, this is, I don't know if you, what does this mechanism look like to you? If you guys type in the uh, chat box what that mechanism looks like. Okay. 
Don't type it all at once, guys. I'm having a hard time reading all of it. There's so many coming in. Come on, guys. You know. You know what this mechanism is. Look, I have a negative charge attacking a carbon while the halogen is leaving at the same time. What does that mechanism look like? Starts with an S and then, there you go, S and two. You got it. Right. It's exactly right. Guys, you don't need a question mark. You guys know it. <laughs> you guys have question marks. You know it. It's an S and two. That's right. All right. My strong nucleophile is attacking the carbon, backside attack, while it's kicking out the halogen at the same time. That's how you make ethers. That's the pretty much the only way we know how to make ethers is an SN2 reaction. Uh, you, you, you could do SN1, but I, I've told you guys that SN2 is really the way that you want to make an ether. Okay, so in order to do it is you first have to take an alcohol and deprotonate it to form the alkoxide ion, right? Because we're going from a weak nucleophile, this is weak, to a strong one because we want the negative charge. So the Williamson ether synthesis is basically an SN2 reaction. That's all it is. So we, so we have already learned this. And, and don't be confused by that sodium. Remember, why is the sodium here? The sodium has to be here because if, if I have a negative charge, I have to have a counter ion, a positively, a positively charged counter ion. So you know what? Just ignore that sodium. Anytime you see sodium, if you see potassium, if you see lithium, anytime that you see a metal, just ignore the metal. Okay? So I have some sort of an alkoxide, an O minus charge. I'm adding it to some sort of a halogen. That attacks, takes out my halogen, and you form an ether. Uh, that's an O plus carbon. Okay, so to form an ether, it's called the Williamson ether synthesis, which is basically an SN2 reaction. Okay. As, uh, let's see, because metals, what does Jacob say? metals are always spectator ions. That's correct. It's exactly right. Anytime you have a positively charged metal, you guys only see half my face. Really um, because metals, uh, exactly, it's a spectator ion. You know, and then if, if, if we look at this further, if you guys really want to analyze it, where is the sodium going? So at the end of the reaction, so here I have the ether, what else have I formed? So the sodium is pairing up with the iodine. So the iodine has to go somewhere, so at the end we're forming sodium iodine. Right? So the iodine's leaving as an as an I minus. Alright? And then I have the sodium that's floating around. So that's where the iodine goes. Alright, and again, that's the non-organic part. Okay. Um, also, if, if you notice, you notice here, alkoxide is prepared. So, in, yeah, in the case here, we're using uh, the sodium hydride. Don't worry about the THF, if you ever see that. That's just a solvent that's being used. I don't know why. This only happens in, um, uh, in, um, in this program. That line thing didn't happen in the other one. So I could have also just used, like, sodium metal as well. So you can either use like, like sodium metal or the sodium hydride to form the O negative and then add some sort of uh, uh, an alkyl halide to form the ether. All right. Any other questions? Uh, the remainder of the chapter is just basically on files, which really isn't anything complicated. Um, but pretty much we got through pretty much almost the... I'm just looking real quick. Yeah, all the important stuff. So tomorrow, what we're going to do is, uh, any questions you guys have on this chapter, we're going to do problems. I also want to do extra synthesis problems. So um, guys, um, I would come like tomorrow. Like last week, only two or three people showed up. I was really expecting a lot more people since, again, just because it's not class, it's still class, but it's good because I went over a lot of um, mechanisms and stuff last Thursday that I think helped a lot of people for the exam on Tuesday. Um, I, I was I, I looked carefully at the types of problems that we talked about on Thursday that people missed on the exam that we talked about on Thursday that were not there on Thursday. But, we, but the people that were there, 
I think they did. Yeah, so Lucas was there, and he said it was very helpful that last Thursday. So don't skip it just because I said to you it's not a class. There's still, it's, if anything, there's probably more important information because I go over problems. Um, it's not just the information. So uh, don't just uh, skip it because I just tell you it's not class. It's still, it's still very helpful uh, stuff. Okay, so I would encourage you guys to still come uh, tomorrow. And then if you're sitting here and you're just like, you know what, I, yeah, I, I, um, uh, Anna was there too. Uh, I, I think, uh, yeah, so. Um, but if you're sitting here in class tomorrow and you're like, you know what, I know all this, I don't need to do it, then leave. You know, I don't want you to, um, I don't want to force you guys to stay here, but I do encourage you to still show up, ask questions, okay? Okay, so with that said, anything else? Uh, will you be? Yes, I will. Uh, you have to work. Okay. All right. So, yeah, that I understand. If you have stuff that they have to do, yeah. Yep. I'm recording. I always recorded it. Um, did I record it last week? I think I recorded that class last week. I think it was there. Let me just check real quick. Um, I'm putting all the recordings. I don't know if, I'm gonna log back in. Uh, and we should be ready for chapter nine on Tuesday. Uh, as far as the material, yes. Watch the rest of this information if you haven't and chapter nine. So next week we can do eight and nine. Um, and again, I don't know how far I'll get. We, we might have to, you know, I'm, I'm not in any rush at this point. You know, we get to what we get to. Um, if we miss stuff, it's not, a, you know, because of how the semester is going, but I feel like we are on, on track. Um, things are going pretty well. Let's see. Okay. Um, WebEx videos. Here we go. Let's see. Yeah, 325, I think. Was that? Did not record it. Yeah, I guess I didn't record last Thursday. Or, if I, or did I? I forget to post it. Um, today, last week. Uh, yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess I didn't. But yes, I will record them from now on. Yeah, and I, I guess I didn't.